Hey everyone, it's great to see you. I hope you're doing well. It has been a long time since I posted any videos on my YouTube page. First, let me thank everyone, all the viewers and the subscribers for supporting my channel in the past. More recently, I have been active in other places, still producing content, you'll just have to find it at different places online. A great place to check out is theproaudiofiles.com. I've got a lot of blog posts over there and also short tutorial videos. You'll also find some of my work, different companies' websites like Waves, Isotope, Sound Toys, I Want That Sound Drum Samples, all great companies. But now in the future, I do have plans to come back around and start the YouTube channel back up. So if you've been waiting for some videos, they're coming at you in the very near future. So stay tuned for that. I've also got some really cool announcements coming up about some new things for you to check out as well. In the meantime, let's get on with today's video. Today we're going to focus on mastering. This is a topic and concept I haven't really addressed in any of my other previous videos. All the other videos have focused on mixing and specifically different kinds of instruments. So how do you do a multi-track drum mix from start to finish? How could you mix electric guitars and vocals, acoustic guitars, bass, and so on? So in this video, I thought I would introduce this topic of mastering. All kinds of people have different ideas about it. What I'm going to do is show you my approach from start to finish. If I've got a mix down, a two track of a song, and I'm going to do the master for it, what's my workflow? What are, what's my signal chain? I'm going to focus specifically on the signal processing. I'll show you the tools that I almost always use on any master and then talk about the process. What am I tweaking here or there? to fit those tools with the song. So let's get started. So here's what we're working with. I've already got a song imported and loaded up in my digital audio workstation. I'm going to be using Pro Tools, but the reality is you could replicate these same exact steps and procedures in almost any DAW. In fact, I know there are a lot of mastering engineers that prefer different digital audio workstations. But for me, as an engineer, because I do some tracking, I do some mixing, and then I do some mastering, I like to use one piece of software to do everything. So I'll use Pro Tools. Now what am I going to be accomplishing here? What am I going to be performing? Well, I've got a stereo audio file that was sent to me by the mixing in, uh, engineer and producer of this song with the expectation that I'm going to master it. What does that mean? Well, in my opinion, there are two main high-level responsibilities or contributions that a mastering engineer brings to a song. The first one uh, all kind of stems from the idea that a mastering engineer provides a fresh set of ears to a song. So you've got a band, you've got a engine, mixing engineer, producer. They've listened to this song dozens and dozens of times. They've probably worked on it for days, weeks, maybe even months. As a mastering engineer, your job is to provide a fresh set of ears, listen to it, and see if you notice anything. Maybe it's problems that needs to be fixed, noise or rumble and that kind of stuff. Maybe it's things that they didn't even uh, notice or kind of lost track of. So a good thing to do as a mastering engineer is to listen very critically. Now, rather than spend a whole long time in the video listening to the song, what I'm going to do is just play a short portion of it. But I would say a good practice, if you're really going to be mastering the song, is listen to the whole thing straight uh, all the way through, from the beginning all the way to the end. Uh, I'll play you just a portion of this song so we can get an impression of it here. This is a song by the band Arcane Atlas. They're based out of Nashville, Tennessee. It's a song called Aubrey. You can find it online in iTunes on their album or also the single here. So let me play back just the first part of it and then we'll get to uh, talking about what I think is the second contribution of the mastering engineer. Alright, so what are we working on here? We're working on a poppy song. It's pretty catchy. It's got some interesting instrumentation. We're working with drums, guitar, bass, vocals, and also some horns. Relatively dry mix. There's not a lot of crazy reverb effects or anything like that. 
Um, it was a pretty clean recording too, and the mix is, is, was done well. Basic levels are in place, nice stereo image, some banding going on. Got a, the basics, uh, the basis here, foundation for a really good track. Uh, the idea then, as a mastering engineer, we're just going to enhance what's already there. Now, it is the case, sometimes you got, you got to fix problems, but I'm not really noticing anything right off the bat with this one. So, the second responsibility then, second contribution of the mastering engineer, is to provide a final polish of the song and make it radio ready. What does that mean? It's kind of a buzzword in audio engineering. Radio ready means that this song is ready to be played side by side with other comparable songs. So if it's going to be played on the radio, play this song and then buy a band that's very similar to it. Uh, you know, or it could be on a CD, it could be on iTunes, whatever. You don't want when a listener is uh, consuming this music that all of a sudden there's some strange thing about your song compared to everybody else's song. Part of that means uh, looking at the level of the song. That's a big thing the mastering engineer does. Uh, looking at the level or amplitude of the song throughout it. And then also considering things like the spectral balance of the song. Does it fit with this style of music? And consider those kinds of things too. So that's going to be the general direction that we're going in. Uh, and what we're going to be looking at doing. Alright, so it's time to maybe start thinking about uh, how do we want to process this signal. As of right now, it's a great mix, but we need to we need to master it. We need to make it radio ready. So before I even start throwing any plugins on it and sending this signal through processors, what I'm going to do, and one thing that I always incorporate in my workflow, is to use some amount of metering. Now, there are plenty of guys that have all kinds of different opinions, and you can argue about this all you want, about whether you should use your eyes in mixing or not. Uh, I'm the kind of person that I like to use whatever information is available to me. I use my ears a lot to listen to things. I also use my eyes to read things on an analysis meter that I couldn't notice and my ears aren't very well, uh, you know, are very good at doing. So here I'm going to use metering in several different ways. Tell me things about the level of the uh, song. Tell me about the spectrum of the song, the panning of the song. This is one tool that has a lot of good analysis uh, meters built in. This is Isotope's uh, Insight plugin. Good one to check out. But for the most part, if you've got uh, anything that'll tell you, you know, similar kinds of things, go ahead and use that as well. Uh, this is just one that I've used a lot. So I'll start out looking at primarily the level here. So make this uh, part of the interface larger. Initially, before I get to anything else, what I'm going to be looking at is, all right, what are the loud parts of the song? And what are the quiet parts of the song? Eventually, we want to get to the point where we have a pretty consistent level throughout the song. We don't want it to drop down too much. We don't want it to jump up or uh, you know surprise someone while they're listening to it. We want a pretty consistent level. Now. What we've got to do is provide that consistent level without destroying the dynamics of the song. We want some things to be louder, we want some things to be quieter, but you know, you want to uh, have the impression or the perception of dynamics uh, without there being too, th too much dramatic changes to those things. So what I like to do is you know, pop through different parts of the song and notice what are my basic loudness levels from one part of the song to the other, from the intro to the verse and so on. At this point, I'm just looking at the relative level. I don't really care about the absolute level too much. So what is the relative level of, say, this part of the song compared to this part of the song? And then think about what can I do to kind of uh, make it more consistent. So here, let's look at the different parts at the beginning. So right around minus 26. All right, so that's quieter, minus 30. It's odd what I felt. Just pour me in the glass, cause your your touch makes me melt. I'm dead. Maybe minus 27 at that point.
another quieter part and then I think it will get louder over here. Alright, and another louder part, maybe around minus 26 again. Now, the initial thing that I'm going to be doing here is changing in a very gradual way the level across the track. Why is that? Make it, again, prep it for basically the other kinds of processing we're going to do. So, later on we'll use dynamic range processing, compressors, limiters to control the level. But, in my opinion, a good thing that you can do off the bat is a very gradual change to the level of these different parts of the signal so it's closer to being consistent. Some songs need this more than others. So I'm going to bring up here the clip gain. Right clicking and bring up show clip gain. Now here, you can destroy the song if you're not careful. Uh, you want to have, even sometimes it helps to look at the whole entire signal here. Uh, and look at it at a high level. What we're going to be trying to do is we know that around this part of the song, I'm going to stretch it out. For several seconds, we're going to provide a quick change to the level of the signal. Bring it up by maybe about two decibels. And look at how long I'm taking for it to ramp. You know, this is going to be several seconds, tens, maybe even 10 seconds or so to go from one part to the next. And what this is going to do is mean that we have more of a consistent level across these different parts. I'll even back this up slightly. Right, you don't want there to be a quick change in the amplitude. You want it to be stretched out. Now as we watch the transition, we should see that the loudness stays closer uh, throughout the song. If you notice and it sounds like there's some major change going on, that's a problem. You don't want this to be an audible thing right now. So let's do a similar process here. In fact, notice that here initially, this part could probably go up closer to two decibels, just like before. And this part, bring it up closer to two and back this one down like this. All right, I think that'll be good. Let's listen to this. So that gives us a little bit of an improvement of what we are working with before. Again, as we add in more processing, compression, compression and limiting, that will take care of, uh, of more of these changes. For me, it's a multi-step process. You don't just want to throw a single limiter on there and crush it, and that's your only way of dealing with the dynamics. You want to use a little bit of clip gain here and there throughout the song. You want to use a little bit of compression, a little bit of limiting. And the more you uh, do it in multiple stages, it's going to help you do it in a nice, smooth, pleasing uh, way that's not too uh, audible. So 
here's where we've been using some metering. And what you'll notice me doing throughout this process is moving this metering around, looking at things before plugins, after plugins, and so on. Also switching between different uh, ones here. So as an example, let's bring up the spectrum analyzer and look at things from low frequencies to high frequencies. One thing I usually like to check when I receive a song is kind of really ultra low frequency content do we have in here? Is it the case there could be some problematic rumble going on down there? Or is that mixing engineer already taking care of that? So let's let's look at this part. So what you want to be careful of and you want to take care of at the last stage here as a mastering engineer, making sure there's no really low frequency energy that your listener's not going to be able to hear anyway. It's difficult to tell, and so just to be safe, what I'm going to do here is pull up a high-pass filter. This is one, I'm, one that I'm going to use. I'll use specifically a linear phase equalizer here. Uh, you know, You don't have to always use this, but it's a good one to use. Uh, at the mastering stage. This is one from Waves, but again, any linear phase uh, one is going to work great for the mastering process. The idea here with linear phase is that it's not going to screw up the phase relationship of other frequencies just by sending the signal through here. Conventional equalizer could uh, make some different kinds of changes. So I'm going to turn on this uh, high pass filter. Around 30 hertz is great. I'm going to turn the dithering off. I don't need that and just worry about it removing those low frequencies. Now, may or may not show up too much difference over here on the spectrum analyzer, but it's a good, safe practice to do. It's not going to cause any problems. All right, now let's move on and think about other processors, other plugins that we like to uh, use here. Initially, the first one that I'll do is uh, looking at compression, and then we'll look at different ways of enhancing the signal after compression, and then we'll look at limiting. So I'll show you some of the tools that I conventionally use. I'll pull up on almost any track and listen to how it sounds. So one is going to be here, uh, the virtual mix rack. So this one has got a great compressor, the FG401 that I like to use. Again, here with compression, my philosophy is that, uh, you know, we can use medium uh, release, usually a slower attack, and maybe just bring it down low ratio just to control the level of the signal slightly. So this will just get us started at least. So a little bit of game reduction. Using compression in multiple stages uh, to control the level. Another one that I really like to use is also from Slate Digital. This is the VBC, the bus compressors. So I'll pull up the rack here. The rack, you've got three choices. Sometimes I'll use them in combination. Uh, my uh, kind of usual starting point is to use the, uh, the one on the top. This is an SSL model. And use it with the fastest release and fastest attack. Now, this is gonna perform something very different than we saw before with the one that was in the mix rack. So this first one, the purpose of it here is just to tame the transients. So what I'm gonna do is bring up the uh, ratio and we should start to see that there's a little bit of gain reduction. If necessary, then I'll lower the threshold until we get that uh, just a few dB. Angelic 
unique and youthful. Nothing compared. So this is where we just want, you know, ever so slight gain reduction being applied at the loudest parts. That's what I'm using this one for. Then this is where I'll bring in. Uh, this is a model then of the uh, a very mu or a Fairchild style compressor, um, a tube compressor. And this is where, again, this is where I'm going to use the slower attack. So back off the attack and medium to fast release is great. Uh, and then just up change the threshold so that we're getting, um, you know, a little bit of gain reduction here. This one's providing more smoothing, so I might elongate the release a little bit more and let the needle uh, stay above zero for a good amount of, of time. Now's a good point to actually A, B, and back and forth. What, are we, what have we got? So the virtual bus compressors, this one, this plugin is known, not only is it going to give you some nice compression, but it's also going to give it some coloration, some analog coloration. Now, some situations you want that, some situations you don't. Uh, it's just something to listen for. We can now also compare that to what, what we had before with the just the VMR. So it does sound nice and smooth. This one's also lifted a little bit, uh, is what I'm hearing. So that's the VBC. Now, another thing that I like to do at this point is also compare uh, similar kinds of compressors, maybe from uh, waves that aren't as uh, as vibey or have as much color. So as an example here, I'll pull up the SSL uh, compressor. This is going to be a similar model, at least in concept to the first one, the FG Gray that we were working with. So here I can try fast attack, fast release, maybe a low ratio, just kiss the needle a little bit with the track by uh, bringing back the threshold. It's a good idea to also listen to at the louder parts of the song. So from my experience, a plugin like this, I, I like actually the fact that it doesn't, uh, the, the analog sort of color isn't too obvious with it. Uh, there are times when I, I just want to add a little bit of compression without it being uh, too, too much color. So this is a case where I might swap out the, actually and use, prefer to use this SSL one uh, from Waves rather than the VBC. But those are kind of uh, decisions to make along the way. So, you know, other options for what you can use here as far as compressors go, there are tons and tons of great ones. Uh, some people like to use multi band compressors, some people like to use uh, model compressors like an API one, um, tons of different options. Uh, we'll also look later on then at the uh, dynamics processing inside of Ozone 6. Um, but really, it's just a matter of uh, figuring out what are you, what are ones that you're comfortable with? What do you like to use? What do you prefer? And and, and getting very confident in in those processors. Just a few things on compression there. Let's also talk about then other ways of enhancing it. So we've already had some analog color saturation harmonics show up. Let's look at some plugins that could be uh, specifically useful for doing that. 
So a few here in here that I like to use uh, with mastering a lot. Um, uh, when it comes to harmonics, you know, it could be something, again, think about this as being a very subtle kind of thing you're trying to do. So one that I love is the Oxford Inflator. This is a soft clipper um, that is going to provide just a, a little bit of a lift to the song, or think of it as everything sounds closer by, by sending it through here. Now you can get very dramatic with it. I'm gonna think about using it more in a subtle way. So let me show you what it can do. As a simple rule of thumb, a lot of guys go by this too. As a mastering engineer, usually what you want to do is is try out a, a processor, try out some kind of way of treating the signal, and when you can hear it, that's great, and then back it off a little bit from there. So in this case, I can hear the inflator is adding something, doing something to the signal. Just back it off a little bit. You know, as you stack these things up one after another, that's when it's going to make an overall difference. So we don't need to accomplish everything just with one plugin. So listen to it and then back it off slightly from there. Let me show you a few other free ones that are available. So uh, here I'll pull up one from SoftTube uh, called the Saturation Knob. This one can be a little bit more dramatic uh, here. You have some more options about whether you want to saturate the low frequencies or high frequencies. I'm just going to add in just a few here, uh, uh, you know, rotating this knob slightly just to add a little bit of saturation. Listen what it does to the track. So that's another free one. If you don't have it, I highly encourage you to download it and uh, use it for this particular purpose. It's great for that. Another free one, this is one from uh, Slate Digital. You can find it under VMR. So, you know, I've already got one instance of this pulled up. I'll pull it over here uh, and open this up. All right, I didn't decide it against that compressor. Here's Revival. Revival is one you've got a way to saturate the high frequencies, add some harmonic saturation for the high frequencies or the low frequencies. This is another good reason why we wanted to take care of rolling off those low frequencies initially. Now that we're going to be saturating a lot of low frequencies in our signal, if we had a bunch of mud and stuff that was down there below what we could hear, as we start to distort it, this is where we could actually have some audible things start to show up with this low frequency harmonic stuff. So let's bypass this one to hear what it's doing. So that's great. I might also at this point try some of the other ones built into VMR, including the mix bus. This is going to be uh, modeling of an analog uh, mix bus and try out some of the different models from the SSL, API. I love the Neve. I use that a lot. Uh, I know a lot of other guys love to use the tube uh, kind of saturation.
right, continue on. Another thing that I'll actually usually try out, uh, even though its main purpose is not for uh, mix bus, is I like this uh, saturation you can drive here at the input using this Neve module. So let's listen to this one. To me, I'm hearing that low end gets extra beefy uh, with that Neve module. So let's listen to these here side by side. So this is where I'm trying to level match so I can hear really what's going on. Great time to pull over the insight over here to this part of my signal chain and look at what's my level coming out of the plugin when I have it bypassed and when I don't. So let me switch over here, pull up the level, and bring the plugin in and out. All right, so I think that's working for me. So those are kind of harmonic, analog, kind of saturation things. Uh, another good one that I'll experiment with is also tape saturation. Uh, this is just another form of harmonic enhancement of the signal. All kinds of different ones uh, to experiment with. Ones from Waves, Kramer Tape is one. Uh, here I usually turn off all kinds of wow and flutter and noise and that kind of stuff. The idea here is just to, uh, uh, you know, uh, smooth off the signal a little bit. Tape is going to be different in its characteristics than an analog desk. So especially if I change things like the tape speed, lower the tape speed, it's going to smooth off the top end. Now that might be a good thing for this particular style of music, uh, pop, rock, or it might not work. So you got to be careful of those kinds of changes. Do I want to, you know, use a lower tape speed? And, and and have that roll off. So let's listen to these things here. Can remove each crevice so it can get dark pretty quick uh, on the top end. Another thing that I'll experiment with a lot here is this flux. This is how you're gonna control kind of that, that glue, that natural compression that happens from tape. Can remove each crevice so again, now we've got another stage here that's performing some subtle compression. We've got the conventional compressors that we looked at before. We were dialing in like the SSL here or the VBC. That's adding some amount of compression. Add in some tape. That's going to be another uh, way of controlling the dynamics. So Kramer tape is a, a good one to try out. Again, I use a lot of these Slate digital ones because they, they work great and they sound uh, fantastic. So pull this one up here.
Again, just out of habit, I almost always pull it up and just uh, back off all the noise. I, I'm not the kind of person that likes to add in much noise to my signal. So here, again, we've got settings for like the two track for like a bus uh, or a mastering sort of situation. Also, I'll experiment with these kind of tape types. Drive the input, it's gonna glue the signal more or compress the signal more. Let's listen to this. Can remove each All right, so that's working pretty well. I'll also demonstrate then uh, while we're at it here. I'll pull up another one. This is one from Waves. This isn't a tape uh, model, but it's a all it's a general purpose uh, saturation sort of tool. So this is Waves Vitamin. It's multiband processing. We'll talk more about multiband processing when we get to uh, isotopes, ozone later on, multiband compression, multiband limiting. We'll look at this one here for a second. Let me uh, just focus and solo this one uh, to work with it. So what's going to happen is as you turn up these knobs, you're going to get more harmonic saturation. It's kind of like a multiband version of the, uh, the Oxford inflator. Now, it's not identical saturation, but as you turn up these knobs in this particular band, you're going to get more. So this is where you can be more picky. You can listen to the song and say, all right, does my mid-range need maybe some enhancing uh, as the top end and all that kind of stuff. So let me play it back and uh, kind of listen for these different ranges. Maybe below about 110 hertz, that's going to be my bass, my kick drum. Mid range up to about 500, that's fine. Uh, 2500 is great for another division here and then the, the really the top end. So let's play around with this one. Can remove each Additionally here, in this plugin, besides just being a harmonic enhancer, we also have panning controls. We can make things wider and narrower. One thing I'll use at this stage is use this knob to, uh, for the low frequencies to center the low frequencies. I don't want anything out wide. I don't want a wide stereo image for low frequencies. I want the bass, the kick drum to be right in the center. You can throw things off if you have really low frequencies on one side of the uh, 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 stereo field or the other. So I'm going to back this one off. Can remove each crevice if we want, we can also enhance the top end. Make it wider. Can So one thing that I notice is as you widen out the stereo field, not only is it going to affect you know uh, how wide things are, but it also draws the listener's attention to it. If I make it narrow, it almost masks or hides the higher frequencies. But as I widen it out, it makes it easier to hear or it provides some separation, 
some interest so your ear and your brain can kind of focus on those frequencies. Can remove each So that's the Waves Vitamin, another great tool to use here at the mastering stage. What I'm going to do next is move on and focus on Isotope Ozone. This plugin can be used for all kinds of different processing, and so I'm going to show you several different parts of it and how I like to incorporate it in my workflow. Isotope Ozone really is my main workhorse as far as processing goes in this signal chain while I'm mastering. I really like what I've already got going here. I've got a lot of plugins pulled up and I can A-B these things later on. Uh, so what I'm going to do to get Ozone going is uh, open up a new auxiliary track. So I'll just get a stereo auxiliary track. I'm going to bust the signal from here, the first track over to this one. Just use any of the buses I've got. Now keep in mind whether you're going to use an auxiliary track or you're going to use a master fader. You got to remember whether the fader itself is pre or post effects. So one of the nice things about an aux track is this is post effects. So if you want to do any fades afterwards, this uh, fader is great for that. Sometimes it's nice to have the fader pre effects. That way you can kind of drive into the compressors and that kind of stuff by using this fader. But no matter what, you can always go back and insert a trim plugin before or after any effects, and it is identical in processing to what this fader is doing anyway. So don't worry about that too much. Just pay close attention to uh, what you're doing there. Be aware of it. Okay, so I'm going to start pulling up some of these plugins here, Ozone, and uh, start working with it. Now that I've got the signal routed from here over to this track. First one I'm going to pull up. I'm going to do some multiband processing here, and I'm going to split it out actually uh, to the different modules. I'm going to pull up Ozone 6 Dynamics. This is only the dynamics part here. Uh, I like to actually split it out this way so I can think of it at a high level in my session, but what's going on, bypass some things, bring them in and listen to it like that, rather than having to open up the uh, whole plugin and then bypass things from there. So I've got the dynamics one pulled up here. Four band to begin with, but in this case, my use of multiband processing really comes down to this. I want to process the uh, really, really ultra low frequencies one way. I'm going to do a heavy compression on them so that my bass is is at a constant level for the most part throughout. I don't have any, you know, ma major changes or things going on there. And then I'm just going to do some subtle compression on the rest of the mix. So I'm going to back this off instead of four bands. I don't want to have to deal with all that. I'm going to go down to two bands. Now here, sometimes I'll experiment with different frequencies, usually starting around 150 hertz uh, in this range is going to be fine. I might audition just the low frequencies here and the high frequencies, and I'll listen for that. Now I'll focus on the individual bands. Again, for my low frequencies, my goal here is to do a fair amount of compression with it. Uh, that way I have consistent level with the low frequencies. That's important to me uh, in my final master. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, get the song going and then bring down the level of the compressor and then also work with the limiter. One of the great things about this dynamics module is it has these two things working together, the compressor and the limiter. So I'll use like a low ratio on the compressor, two to one usually. I'll also for the low frequencies back off the release. You'll see me do that. And then I'll use a limiter with pretty fast attack and release uh, to really catch the, the peak levels and use more of a lower ratio on the compressor to act more as a smoother across the whole signal. So let's get to compressing the low frequencies. Can Nothing 
compares. Now what I'm going to watch here is the amount of gain reduction going on and apply some amount of makeup gain so I'm not losing all that bass in the low end. Can remove each Also audition another part of the song, listen to it there. Here, I'm, uh, there's a little bit of lead vocal coming in, so I'm going to lower this frequency even more. So I'm really just focusing on the kick drum and the bass that I want to get leveled off. Next, let's focus on the higher parts, the higher frequencies. I'll solo this. Here's going to be more subtle compression. I'm not looking for 10 decibels of gain reduction. I might just be looking for a few decibels. I'm still going to use a low ratio here. I like to use a low ratio throughout the process when mastering, but I'll bring in a little bit of the limiter just to uh, catch, the, catch the peaks again. Another thing I'll do here, now that I've got the compression basically where I want it, I'll probably have to come back later on and tweak it as I start to add in more of these other effects. I'll A-B it a little bit and get the overall gain uh, at something that's uh, comparable. So this compression, what I'm hearing, it's acting as lifting uh, the signal. As I bring it back in, even if the output gain is, is about the same overall level, it's still, by compressing it, it's uh, tightening things up, especially in the low end, and giving it that little lift. So that's how I like to use the dynamics module. Let me show you some things how I like to use the EQ module. Uh, so this is another one, part of Ozone 6. Uh, I got used to doing it, using it this way back in Ozone 5, uh, and it's got similar kind of features. Now, when you pull it up, what you're seeing here is a bunch of different bands that you can tweak and you can adjust and fine tune things as much as you like, and that's great. Uh, for me, I actually want to use it for another purpose here. Uh, and uh, I use it based on a reference. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to make use of this matching uh, feature. And what I'm going to do is say that, you know, for most styles of music, we're going to have some kind of roll-off, pink noise or 6 dB. 
Usually pink noise is is good for me to use uh, here that we want our music to kind of have this shape uh, to it. We don't want too much low frequencies uh, and we want our high frequencies to kind of roll off naturally. Uh, so this is a reference. I don't match it one for one, uh, but I use this to help me uh, balance the spectrum. So here when I'm using this equalizer, it's not to uh, do any detailed kind of spectral processing. This is actually at the high level how I just want to balance low frequencies and high frequencies. And this is a very quick, intuitive way, a uh, simple way to get a balance based on uh, some reference here that I, that like the pink noise. Sometimes I'll also do this with uh, other comparable songs like a reference track, but pink noise, is, this curve is going to be perfectly fine. So here what you got to do is capture the uh, music, your song, and then tweak the settings here on the match curve, and you'll see the, the equalization that gets applied to it here. So let me capture it. So that's plenty to get the balance of the song. Now what I'm going to do is turn on the matching and you're going to see a curve that's getting applied. This is an EQ curve. Uh, it's just across the whole spectrum. Now I usually like to smooth it out. I don't like to see a lot of ripples in it like this. I don't want to see those ripples. I want it to be much more smooth. So sometimes that means 80, 90% smoothing. Then I have one setting, the amount. That's going to change the spectral tilt. Usually going to dip down the lows and it's going to bring up the highs. So it's a combination of these things all together. But it's going to give me one way to control, all right, how much of the low end do I want? How much of the top end do I want? Just by doing it like this. And I, and I love being able to control it uh, with just this one parameter. So I'll play it back and tweak some of these things. So I really like what it's doing. It's a, it's a subtle way to spectrally shape it. Uh, but this is, again, going to be much closer to that radio kind of sound. Uh, the reality is, most of the time when we're mixing, we mix up the bass too loud. So job of the mastering engineer, make sure the bass doesn't get too loud. Uh, so in this case, we need to carve it out a little bit. You compare this side by side with something you're going to hear on a radio. It's going to be the case that you need to uh, make sure the bass doesn't get out of hand. That's why I've got kind of the two stages. Dynamics processing to really compress and hold that level throughout the song of the bass by using heavy compression there. And then this stage, I'm using this kind of spectral curve to make sure it's under control. So I've got now those two things going. Um, at this point, I think what I'll do is also pull up here and look at uh, Isotopes Insight. See where we're working uh, on this one. So really the last stage to get into is trying to uh, bring up the level, can use a limiter here or the Isotopes uh, maximizer, uh, something close to, you know, a, a radio ready level. And this is going to be, for me, engineers will shoot for different things. I'll, I'll reference the loudness here, integrated loudness, short term uh, loudness from uh, Insight. And I'm also going to use the peak and RMS uh, here from the maximizer. So I'll probably start out shooting for this around 12. Then what I'm Next, I'll bring up the Maximizer plugin. 
This is absolutely my preferred limiter uh, to use here. We need to see the level that's coming in now. And I'll decide from there what my plan of attack is going to be. So I've got plenty of headroom going on. My peaks are only minus 10 uh, decibels full scale. So I've got plenty of room to work with. One thing I could do here is bring up the input fader like this uh, to do that. And, and that's perfectly fine. What I like to do is have the ability uh, to easily automate and control things. So I'll actually, what I'll do here is bump these plugins down and insert a trim plugin. I use trim plugins a lot as it's just a simple volume control. Uh, and I think it's great because you can automate them uh, and, and see where things are on the uh, track. So here I've got the trim plugin now pulled up. So I can, you know, if I'm my peaking at, at, at minus 10, maybe I'll bring this up six decibels and uh, watch what happens then. Another thing, just uh, for the sake of the viewers on YouTube, what I'll do here is I know as I start to limit this, it's really going to get louder. So I'm actually going to back off this post fader uh, just for now while we are going through the video so it doesn't get too much. So I've got, for the most part, plenty of signal coming into my limiter now. Uh, so take you through the setup. Usually I will audition some of these different uh, methods of doing limiting. Uh, I really like and usually end up using the IRC3, so I'll just start with that. It's a matter of, I'll set my, my ceiling maybe minus 0.3. Somewhere between minus 0.3 and minus 0.5, usually. I want to make sure that if somebody takes this and turns it into an MP3 or something like that, we're not getting uh, uh, peak clipping or anything like that. I'll also turn this true peak limiting on so there's no intersample peaking happening for the signal that I'm creating uh, and so on. Now it's just a matter of uh, bringing down the threshold uh, as a starting point watching here the peak i'm not going to clip with the ceiling set at minus uh, 0.3 watching the rms and also watching here the loudness so i'm kind of trying to shoot for uh radio level somewhere in the range of probably minus eight uh is going to be plenty loud uh for for this some people will go further and in the case of short-term uh loudness here minus 12 minus 10 somewhere in that range at the loudest parts uh, so let me play it back and start to tweak some of these parameters Now the next thing I'm going to demonstrate is how I, I will finalize kind of the process of limiting. So here I've got a starting point. I've got things, you know, not too crushed, not too limited. Uh, and then what I'll do is kind of go back through the song and automate some of these parameters. So the two main ones that I'm working with that I'm going to work 
on are, are starting with this trim. This is the mount that I'm pushing into the limiter. So I'm going to uh, open this one up, Control, Option, Command, and click. Enable automation for gain. So now this one will show up over here, and I can kind of send the signal into the uh, limiter more. And then another thing that I'll do is set select this threshold. So here I'm going to go in, find this uh, threshold for the maximizer, add it, click OK. And this is my other parameter that I'll have in here at the maximum. Now, it's probably a good uh, stage also to um, decide what kind of, of these extra additional sweetening effects that I've got going on here that I want to use, whether it's going to be the VBC, kind of for that uh, excitement that it gives um, compared to the SSL compressor. And so I've got the, the signal prepared for when it's going to go in here. That way when I start um, automating some of these things, it, it's going to be the final mix. So let me quickly decide uh, by listening to some of these what I want to include. So let's go to let's start at the beginning of the song and make space for some of these things <clears throat> I've got my loudness going over here. I can reset that one I'll watch here also the peak in the RMS levels and I've got the trim So now we'll go through think about whether I want to drive the input to the limiter and back off the threat And then also change the level of the threshold. So I have those two things going together In fact, maybe what I'll do is open them up side by side Bring this one down to the trim gain. Plenty. And then also the maximizer threshold. All right. Start from the beginning of the song. Again, we're going to be looking for maybe around minus 11, minus uh, 10, that range uh, at the output. RMS level, maybe around minus 9 or so. They wash away all of the dark I like the sound of rain But only your tender voice Can remove each crevice So I think the level is getting too much a little bit once the vocal comes in. So this is where I'll automate just a small change 
and uh, watch the result. You don't have to talk. Your eyes flood my heart and they wash away all of the dark. I like the sound of rain, but only your tender voice can remove each crevice of pain. So here at the transition, I need to bring up the level a little bit more at the input. about half a dB there. And also what I'm gonna do then is bring down the threshold of the limiter. Give me a little bit more limiting happening there. So here, as the vocals come back in, I need to bring the, the level back up on the threshold. This is These are all just very gradual changes, but it's going to make all the difference to keep the level proper uh, throughout the song. Angelic and youthful, nothing compares. That's why I catch my breath and stare at you. Those luscious lips, so inviting. But the smile they form just inspire all kinds of marvelous writing. Okay, so let's transition again, bring this level down so it's not driving the limiter as much. Be careful on this uh, limiter, back the level up a little bit. Right, I think you get the idea. I'm going to go ahead uh, off camera and, and finish this up for the song and then I'll show you the last details here of finalizing your master. All right, I went ahead throughout the whole song and made some minor tweaks to the input gain of my limiter and also the threshold of the limiter. What are the lessons? What are the points to take away from this? First off, automation is key in mastering. Don't just think that you're going to set your level of your threshold and that's going to be it. You pick one level and leave it there the whole song, right? That's going to set you up for two things. One is to over compress the loud parts of the song and you're going to under compress uh, the parts in the song that are quiet, right? You don't just want to find a happy medium and leave it there the whole time. You want to compress the loud parts enough and you want to compress the quiet parts enough. Make sure that you're bringing up the level throughout the whole song, right? So automation is, is the first thing. Second off, look at how small of the changes of these changes that I'm making, right? They're half a dB, maybe one dB maximum and things that I'm adjusting throughout it, right? This is because the way that I have structured the signal chain, I'm doing dynamic range compression at several points, right? I'm not trying to do, you know, too much dynamic range compression in any one place. Start out, knock a few dB off in one place, knock a few dB off in another place, right? I'm shrinking the, the difference between the RMS and the peak. That's what I'm doing in several places. So that's going to give you a much more natural uh, form of dynamic range compression, make it less audible. So that's a good thing you should be trying to do, right? You don't have to be too dramatic with the effects that you're doing, especially at the mastering stage. Do things in a minor way, and if you're hearing it, maybe you need to back things off a little bit. So just to kind of compare where we're at uh, here, I went ahead and printed the audio onto another audio file, just so we can look at it within the session at what did we start out with and what did we end up with? 
right? You can see in this audio file, certainly I brought up the overall level of the track compared to what we started out with. That's one of the main tasks we're uh, set out to do here with mastering. Uh, I try my best though, way that I processed it, make the level even, but not kill the dynamics. There are loud parts of the song, there are quiet parts of the song, but the level is much more consistent now. Uh, I also tried to maintain a lot of that of the dynamics. Right by shooting for these target ranges with the loudness and RMS, you know I have some room to work with. The client comes back, it comes back to me and says I need things to be louder. I can always make a few, maybe squeeze out another dB or more of compression, and that's that's going to be fine. But I, I've been conservative at this point to try and maintain as much of the uh, dynamic range as possible. Uh, by bringing up the loudness at the same time. So those are things you have to juggle and you have to decide, you know, you have to have standards as yourself as an engineer and then also work with your clients on that. So maybe just to compare where we're at here, what I'll do is try and level adjust this track to match uh, the one we've got here. Let me go ahead and if I switch over. Now what we're going to be able to do, I will... Uh, bypass all these plugins we'll be able to see the on this one if I bring up another version of insight on this track okay we'll look at the loudness on this one and compare it to the loudness over here on the process track so let me bring the clip gain down I think it'll be helpful if I shrink these up bring the clip gain down Let's watch the loudness and then we'll, I'll solo and jump back and forth and we can hear not only the dynamic range processing that's going on, but also ways that we've been enhancing the signal uh, along the way. So let's do this. Okay, so the one on the right will end up being the one for the process track and the one on the left is the unprocessed track. So right, I'm hearing at the process track, not only have I brought up the level of everything so that it's more consistent, but it, it sounds cleaner, it sounds crisper, it doesn't sound dull. The first one almost sounds dull now. So lots of different things that happened along the way. But right, if you remember, each step along the way, we only made minor changes. So that's a, a good practice to get into as far as mastering is concerned. So let's wrap this thing up. Uh, a few more things that I want to cover um, right, I've just printed this track temporarily just for A, B purposes. When it comes to uh, wrapping things up at the end of the mastering process, right, you need to be careful about maybe adding some dither noise in here. Isotope has a built in, this is going to be perfectly fine. You can do some noise shaping to make it less uh, audible, move the energy of the noise up into higher frequencies. Don't get too crazy with this, it's just a good thing to have in there. Most of these things that you include, low amount, medium amount, those are going to be perfectly sufficient for accomplishing the dither that you need. Right? Lots of other great resources you can check out on that. Another thing uh, to pay attention to is your fades. As a mastering engineer, you're responsible at the end of the day of making sure at the beginning of the song and the end of the song that the fades are done appropriately. Sometimes it's helpful actually to print the audio onto a track and do the fades there. In other situations, you got to make sure that you're doing the fades post effects. So I've got this auxiliary track set up. I could automate this uh, fader right here as a way of, of doing the fades at the beginning and at the end, right? You wouldn't want to automate things at the 
like for instance here with the clip gain this is pre effect so if your effects add in noise or anything like that what you want to make sure is you got the fade after all the effects and everything that's going on that's another reason to be careful about using the master fader master fader uh, track in Pro Tools is gonna the fader is gonna be pre effects you want to make sure your fade that you automate you draw in is gonna be post effects or you could print the audio file and then do the automation here as well. So lots of different options there. So I guess that'll wrap things up for this mastering tutorial. I hope you picked up some tricks and some ideas along the way. I shared a lot about just my approach, my philosophy when it comes to mastering. You have to do it several times over and over and over again uh, to really get your feel for it. What kind of tools you like to use. I've kind of settled in on a handful of tools. You know, even though I've got dozens and dozens of plugins, it's usually about 10 that I'm working with uh, to just to mastering. I think that it really speeds up the workflow to make those kinds of decisions. So I guess that'll take care of everything for this video. Stay tuned for plenty of other things coming up in the very near future. I know it's been a while since I posted a video. I will have more coming up here and also some big announcements about new projects coming up in the future for you guys to check out. So until next time, take care guys.